Oh, I'm so glad to be back. So glad to be here with you today to share a message with you today. The Lord is good. He's done marvelous things and he continues to do marvelous things for us all. Amen. Amen. You know, the word of God is fascinating. The word of God will will minister to you right where you are. Even the very same word will minister to several people simultaneously right where you are. It'll reach into the place where you need it to reach. It'll touch what you needed to touch. It'll heal you. It'll prosper you. It'll deliver you. It'll set you free. It'll bring you joy. It'll bring you whatever you need because the word of God is faithful. It is true and it is. It is real. It is real. And we thank God for his word today. Hallelujah. We thank God for the word that we are going to receive today. And it is a message entitled heal my daughter. Now, Sometimes the words that I speak are not, they don't seem like they're really for the real young Christian. But I tell you, the word of God has an ability because it is spirit and it is life. It has an ability to reach even the young hearts, even down all the way to the mature hearts and on up to those who are well versed in the word of God. There is something in the word of God for us all, for each and every one. Hallelujah. So today, let us turn to two different scriptures, and you may not see how they go together, but we pray the Spirit of God will minister how those scriptures go together. Uh, We're going to turn to Luke 8 and also to Isaiah 9. We're going to turn to Luke 8, chapter 8, verses 41 through 48, and then to Isaiah 9, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, we glorify you. We thank you for being a sovereign God. We thank you for keeping us through the storms of life, through the spiritual storms, but Lord, also through the natural storms as winds rage and the storms blow and the the clouds burst forth and bring forth rains in their season and even sometimes more rain than we expect. We thank you, Lord, for keeping your hand of protection about, about us, for being the God of our strength, for being our helper and for being our ever present help, even in times of trouble. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for your truth, for your peace, for the shalom of God. And we thank you that our understanding and and our, the eyes of our understanding and, and our knowledge and our wisdom is being increased even as the word comes forth to make us better than we are now, more than we are now, that we can be more than conquerors and that we can be victorious in this Christian walk, drawing others to us by our model and by our victories. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now we read Luke 8, starting with verse 41. Then a man named Jairus a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. And Jesus was on his way. The crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately Her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. That he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Isaiah 9, beginning with verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. Amen. We all know the story of Jesus going along in the crowd, in the press. We know that 
He was, you know, just as the famous celebrities of today, they have bodyguards to keep people from bumping up against them or worrying them for autographs or pressing up against them. But Jesus had a different kind of thing going on when someone pressed up against him. Because if you ever get into the presence of God, if you press into the presence of God, and if you press in with faith, you can draw from the power, the virtue of the most holy one, and you can draw power for your deliverance. You can draw power from the presence of God from being in his presence for your deliverance for your healing for your prosperity for your peace or for your joy but hey I said at the beginning that the word of God brings all of those things to you praise God that is true but in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and without him was not anything made that was made you see Jesus is the word therefore the word brings you all those things but the word has to reach you and you have to reach the word sometimes and is that not man's quest as he is constantly pressing into the presence of God reaching for the hand of God the touch of God the the countenance of God to fall on him Lord look my way Lord look upon your servant so that the presence of God the spirit of God will be present that we may receive in times of trouble in times when we need help we may receive of the power and the might and the strength and the majesty and the glory and the riches of God hallelujah Hallelujah. So Jesus is walking along on his way to heal a man's daughter, to heal a man named J. Iris, to heal his daughter, J. Iris. J. Iris was a, the ruler of the synagogue. He was the ruler of the synagogue in Capernaum. Capernaum is a city in Israel. Capernaum is translated the city of comfort. Now, what more comfort would a man need that his daughter was sick? And they sent for Jesus to come and raise up this girl from her sick bed. But while he was on the way, he stopped to do a thing for a woman who had great faith. Faith to reach out. Faith to press in. And you know, you've heard that this minister many times before. That this woman wasn't even supposed to be out with an issue of blood. Because she was considered by Jewish, Jewish custom unclean. But she used her faith. She risked her life because her life was leaking from her anyway. And she came out and pressed. And Jesus said, who touched me so while Jesus was on the way to do a work someone came up and touched him now has that ever happened to you and I don't mean about the power flowing from you or virtue flowing from you or anyone taking anything from you but has it ever happened to you that you were on your way to do something and someone distracted you good or bad they distracted you now I ask, has it ever happened to you that you have ever been on your way to do something, a good something, something you were called to do, something you were supposed to do, but on the way something happened that distracted you in a negative way that held you up or delayed you? Because in verse 49 of Luke 8, we find out that another messenger was sent to say, look, J. Iris, your daughter's dead. Don't even bother the rabbi anymore. Don't even bother Jesus anymore. Because before she was sick and we sent for a healer. But then she, they, the message came in verse 49 saying she was dead. Have you ever been distracted to the point that the thing that you were going to do. That you were well able to do. That you had reputation to be able to do. That you were comfortable and confident and even had done before. You were on your way to do that thing. But somebody distracted you and it kept you from getting to the place where you needed to get. And somebody who was counting on you who had called for you died or something fell to the wayside or something was ruined and seemingly never to be raised up again because you couldn't get where you wanted to get or where you need to get or where you were called to be in time to be that has that ever happened to you has it ever happened to you that yes that did happen and then you yourself became distraught you yourself became disheartened or discouraged or you yourself may have realized well I only had the ability to do this when the situation was like that or only had the, the ability to do this if the situation remained like that but when the situation grew worse then you had no power for instance if you've ever unfortunately had a bill collector to call your house they'll say if you come over to our the place where you made this purchase or where you did business or if you will send in the mail this amount of money and if it reaches here this day then I can do this for you have you ever been distracted where you forgot or didn't put the stamp on the letter or just didn't have the the fifteen dollars or ever what you had to send in and once you were you looked and you realized the time had passed 
that you were able to get that resurrection to your credit or that resurrection to your grace or to get that extra time added on to pay that bill out in full and then something else happened that was beyond your power and beyond the power of the person who was called to help you when in reality you may have taken that 15 or 50 dollars ever what you needed to send to the, the the company that you were doing business with and you may sincerely have helped another person out maybe a person who didn't have anything to eat or any clothes to wear or any place to sleep and God says Jesus said if you've done it unto the least of them you've done it unto me perhaps you were such a person who took that money and you used it you took that power because money is power you took that power and you applied it to another situation that seemed more pressing hoping that you could get to that other thing in time well look at here it looks like Jesus did the same thing because someone touched him and when someone needs you when someone touches and pulls at your heartstrings and they say can you lend me fifty dollars until Thursday or Friday when you know you needed that money Wednesday yourself this is just a good example then someone touches you and then they draw virtue out of you. They draw power from you. They draw that out of what? Your bank account and ultimately out of your hands. And so Jesus, the woman with the issue of blood. Thank you, Jesus. The woman with the issue of blood. Let's go back and read what was said that I'm reading NIV. I know I usually read King James, but I'm reading NIV because it is a good reading Bible. The woman, when she realized she had been found out, verse 47, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, the woman came trembling and fell at his feet, at Jesus' feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And then he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. The woman realizing that she was going to be found out, she, she couldn't. I mean, let's face it, you get in the presence of God, you are not going to be able to lie unless you just want to drop dead. Like Ananias and Sapphira were in the presence of the Holy Spirit and lied. So this woman who came and it looked like she took what was to belong to the little girl. It looked like it looks like what has happened now is this woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years, who had what spent all she had spent all of her living had gone to the doctors and was no better off and none of the doctors could help her this woman as Jesus is on his way think of this now carrying a gift perhaps wrapped in a beautiful package it's almost as if Jesus is on the way taking a gift to the young girl and then the older woman comes up and steals the gift from him so now it looks like this woman has stolen the life of the younger this is what it looks like. But what has happened is we are talking about Jesus. We're talking about a mighty God. We're talking about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We're talking about an omnipotent God. We're talking about God whose arms are not too short to reach you in your situation right now today. We're talking about an all powerful God. We are talking about one who has all ability and all strength and power. Power belongs to God. Hallelujah. So even if the woman with the issue of blood came up and took power from Jesus, that wasn't all the power Jesus had. And we thank God for that. So you look at your neighbor, your, your neighbor, you're on the pew here to the left or the right of you. Even if God does everything your neighbor needs and wants him or her to do for him or her, he's still got enough for you. There is no slackness in the kingdom of God. There is no slightness in the kingdom of God. There is no lack in the kingdom of God. There is enough for all. So even though the woman with the issue of blood became healed, she was completely healed. There was still enough to heal J. Iris' daughter. But wait a minute. Let's go back to the story because I've told you again that in verse 49, what has happened in verse 49, Luke 8 and 49, let's read that. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and said, your daughter is dead. He said, don't bother the teacher anymore. So at that moment in the natural, it looks like the one woman got healed and she even drew the virtue out. And at the same time, the daughter. J. Iris is, let me say, only daughter. 
Now, if any of you have only one child, you, you can feel me. You know what I'm talking about here. J. Iris is only daughter. But remember, Jesus is walking the earth clothed as a man. He is God's only begotten son at this time. And so this child is now dead. But Jesus walking through the streets of Capernaum, glory to God. Jesus walking through the city of comfort. He says in verse 50, hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. Now, wait a minute. How can she be healed if she's already dead? Healed if she was sick yet. But yes, but dead. Now she's going to be healed. Now, Jesus always did talk funny, you know, calling things that be not as though they are. So Jesus is giving comfort to this man, this synagogue ruler. And that goes to another place. God reigns on the just and the unjust alike. But one thing for sure, he will look after those who look after his. He will look after those who look after his house, his synagogue, and those who rule well are due of double honor. And you can rule well. You don't have to be a pastor or a deacon or some type of leader in the church to rule well. You can rule your family well. You can rule your household well. You can be a wise steward over your finances in your household. You can be a good steward over your spousal relationship, over your marriage. You can be a good husband. You can be a good husbandman to your wife. Wives, you can be a good helper, a helpmate to your husband. This is ruling your affairs well, looking well to your herds. Hallelujah. You know, verse the verses in Proverbs 31 gives all of the things that a woman, a virtuous woman should do and could do. She's not just a helper who sits there twiddling her thumbs until her husband gives her something to do. Glory to God. She is a proactive person handling, how do they say, her business, handling her business very well. So you too can be a ruler over the things of God. As a matter of fact, God created male and female, created he them and put them in dominion. You are called to sit in dominion. A dominion means that you rule. You have a domain. You are a king or a queen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So God will see about you if you see about what you're supposed to see about. You're not just put here on earth for show or to hang clothes off of so you can look good and have your friends tell you you look good. You are not just put here to go and get your hair styled so you can see what can what you know what it can look like next. You have a strong spiritual purpose here in the earth. Hallelujah. So Jesus said, "Be don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed." So when Jesus, when he arrived at the house of Jairus, verse 51, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John and James and the child's father and mother. 52. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing. Jesus said she's not dead, but asleep. She is not dead, but asleep. Stop wailing. Now, that's a word to you. That's a word to us all. Sometimes when we think it's over, it's not over till Jesus, till God says it's over. Stop wailing. Stop mourning. Till you get the word from God that it's over, it's not over. Stop wailing. Stop mourning. Stop your grief. They are living in a city of comfort. And what city could have more comfort than a city that has the manifest presence, the manifest and abiding presence of Jesus Christ himself right in the midst of you? There can only be comfort because his spirit, once it was released into the earth, what was the comforter? Hallelujah. So stop whining, stop wailing, stop mourning, stop complaining. This is the same lesson that the wilderness walkers had to learn. Stop complaining. Stop, stop reaching your own conclusion and lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge God. Jesus says she is just asleep. And then. 53, verse 53, they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. So they thought they knew more, knew more than Jesus. Could that be some of our problem in here? We have leaned to our own understanding and we think we know more than Jesus. If Jesus says somebody's asleep, baby, they're asleep. They're not, they're not dead. If Jesus says they're going to live to the glory of God, then that's what they're going to do. Lean to your own understanding. Leaning to your own understanding is what will cause you to disrespect authority, disrespect civil authority and spiritual authority. Notice J. Iris didn't laugh. Notice the mother didn't laugh. Now, how can you go from wailing to laughing? Unless you're a double-minded person. Just from one verse to the other. I'm sure almost no time passed. 
I'm sure almost no time passed, maybe less than a minute. They went from wailing and mourning to laughing at Jesus. Even if Jesus was wrong and they thought the girl was still dead, why were they not continuing to mourn? But it didn't say they laughed because joy overcame them. No, they laughed at Jesus because they felt like they knew more than he did. But the book of James talks about wisdom. It said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives liberally and upbraideth not. So the wisdom of this world is not pure, but the wisdom of God is first. It's pure and it's just. And the wisdom of God is what we need in order to even conduct our lives because stuff we see is not even what it looks like. It's not even what it looks like. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Because I'm about to get into the meat of this thing right now. Right now, we're just we're just building this thing up so we can understand what the word is trying to teach us, what the Lord is trying to share with us today in this hour and how he wants us to receive it in our very own hearts that we can be changed and we can be edified and stand up straighter and know according to the word and the wisdom and the truth of God. What it was that Jesus has taught here in the city of Capernaum and how it can apply to our lives today. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 54. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Hmm. Her spirit returned and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Now, there's your lesson in pride. There's your lesson in pride. I don't know how many of you have heard this before, but hey, when I came into the room, when I prayed, when I did this, and then the Lord had me to say this, and then this happened and that happened, Jesus, who had been laughed at on the outside, when he shut the door, caused the girl to have a life to return, her spirit to return back into her, in essence, had raised her up from the dead. Now, Jesus had raised a few people up in his walk. We raised them up from the dead, raised them up from the dead and told them, don't even tell anybody that she was dead because that would have been just too marvelous of a thing. But when you think about the epidemic it could have caused, if everybody walked around talking about how Jesus had raised all these different folk from the dead, can you imagine the kind of dead that would be laying around stinking at people's houses that would be just laying there and they're waiting for Jesus to come through so they could be raised back up again. Folk who probably needed to be dead because sometimes God will require a person's soul of them. If they're not living right and they're reprobate and they're backslidden and they just don't want to change, just want to keep on doing what they want to do. If God requires your soul of you, if he's already required it, he's not going to repent and give it back. So these folk probably would have had their dead laying around everywhere. But of course, Jewish custom was don't touch the dead and they have to be buried in a certain time frame. So it was going to going to it was going to really mess up their Jewish culture. But what it really was going to mess up was Jesus's job was he was coming to the spiritually dead, not to the physically dead. But Jesus raised this 12 year old girl up. And now we're going to get into a little bit of 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 the, the depth. Yeah, that's the word, the depth of what has happened because she's already done a great deal and we have subject we've given the subject to this message heal my daughter and the woman with the issue of blood was somebody's daughter too Jairus's daughter was somebody's daughter but you see the woman with the issue of blood even though she had suffered a great deal of time we don't know who her parents were we don't know if she was married and who her husband was we don't know what kind of covering she had we don't know if she had the kind of covering that was a godly uh, covering for that time if it was a christian or jewish covering for that time if it was appropriate for uh, the people, let's say if the Pharisees or the Sadducees would recognize it as good enough for Jesus to deal with. Because even the centurion said that he wasn't worthy for Jesus to come into his house because he knew he was a Roman. He was Italian. He was not even a Jewish man. But J. Iris didn't have any qualms in asking the teacher, the rabbi, to come and heal his only sick daughter. But this other woman who, whose father is not mentioned, whose name is not mentioned, whose lineage is not mentioned, whose level of prosperity is only mentioned in that she had spent all she had. Now, we don't know if she had a lot. And then she had spent it all or if she only had a little and she had paced it out over 12 years or if people had been helping her and giving her alms and she had spent all of that. But we know now she was at a place where she didn't have any more. 
But Jairus's daughter was the daughter of the synagogue ruler. Jairus was somebody. Jairus was prominent in the community. Jairus was prominent in the religious community. Jairus was someone who pretty much had access to Jesus. Jairus's servants even had access to Jesus. But the woman with the issue of blood had to press her way in by herself. You know, we've heard stories of healings in the Bible where, you know, the people drop the man in on the roof and someone helped the man to get in the pool. He needed to help to get in the pool. No one is saying this woman even had any help. She was on her own, baby, pressing in into this throng, this multitude of people, even pressing past 12 disciples that probably had Jesus surrounded and how many others pressing past men and in her weakened condition. Now, have you ever felt like that? I don't have anybody to help me like the men at the pool. I don't have anybody to put me in when the water is troubled. I don't have anybody to help me even get to church. I don't have anybody to help me pray. I don't have anybody to help me. But in her determination and in her need and in her faith, because it was her faith that had made her whole. Her faith is what got her out of her house. She says, I'm going to be healed. She didn't say, I'm going to go out here no matter what happens. If it doesn't happen the way I want, this will happen. But hey, at least it'll be over. But it, she, her faith was, I'm going to be healed. Because if she had touched him without faith, she wouldn't have drawn anything. It's kind of like going to the bank to withdraw money. You have faith, so you fill out the withdrawal slip or you write the check. If you don't have any faith, you just stand there. And they don't know what you want. Well, Jesus is the same way. you got to use faith to draw from the Jesus bank account. Hallelujah. So one woman has to push her way in. One woman has to bogart her way in. One woman, we don't know, the older woman, but she's still somebody's daughter. And she still required and wanted healing. The other girl... She didn't do the pressing for herself. She didn't do the seeking for herself. She had a mom. She had a dad. She, her dad and the family had servants to send for the servant to come. And then they mosey on over to the house to help her. She was just a gracious recipient. Come on with me now. She was just the gracious recipient of what was being arranged for her to have. And isn't God good to us? Because we are. We cannot earn our salvation. We cannot earn favor. We cannot earn grace. We cannot earn any of the promises, the blessings that he has for us. But he is faithful and he is gracious and he is loving and he is merciful. And he tenderly blesses us with all wonderful things that he's promised us and gives us his grace, even surrounding us as a shield. Hallelujah. 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 So. We have someone who is sent for the healer to heal us in our sickness, to heal us in our needs, to heal us in our places of desperation or loneliness or, or disappointment or discouragement. We have someone who is sent for the comforter. And that was Jesus Christ who left the comforter for us here in the earth, the city of comfort in Capernaum, where this, these, this miraculous healing and this miraculous resurrection took place all in the same day and probably all in the same hour if it was indeed a village where the houses were not too far apart as indeed they were walking. So what are we saying here? We're going to look at, we've looked at some of the differences of the two women. Remember, one was younger, one was older, but they were both somebody's daughter. Heal my daughter. Heal my daughter. Now, men, if you're listening to this message, this is not an exclusive message for women. You can receive from this. And I'll tell you how. Well, let's put it this way. If you keep listening, you will definitely receive from this message. Heal my daughter. And I tell you why. Because, well, I'll tell you why when we get there. Or you, the Lord will make it clear. I don't want to confuse things. I want to make it clear. Praise God. So, there were these two females who needed healing. One, as I've described, we don't really know her name, where she lived, who her people were. We don't know if she had other brothers and sisters. We don't know if she was the only daughter, too. We don't know. We don't know if she was married, if she was a mother, if she was a single mother. We don't know. But for 12 years, 12 years, you know, if you have pain in your body for 12 minutes, that's a long time. 12 days, some of you are ready to throw in the towel. 12 months, some of you don't know what to do. 12 Years Now, I'm not saying she had pain because the Bible didn't say that, but I'm sure she had emotional pain wondering what's wrong with her. If any of you have ever been sick, I have had chronic illness 
myself. It was like a muscular thing, but I wondered as much why was I having it and what was the cause of it because no one seemed to really be able to diagnose it which didn't matter anyway, because the Lord has completely healed me. Thank you, Jesus. But no one was able to diagnose it. So that caused as much of, of a perplexing uh, nature to the problem to me as actually the physical pain of having it. Do you follow what I'm saying? Amen. So this woman did have pain. Did she have physical pain? I don't know. Probably. Probably. And she probably was getting very weak. But as Jesus was on his way, to heal J. Iris's 12 year old daughter, there was a woman for the same number of years, 12 years. Had you ever noticed that now? There was a woman for the same number of years, 12 years, who had had an issue of blood and was losing life. So there was one girl who was born into position and status. She was gaining life from age zero to 12 until she became sick. And then there was a woman who from the time that that young girl was born up until the very same day, maybe the same hour was losing life for 12 years what is the significance of the number of 12 12 is the number of government 12 is the number of government so in this 12 year time frame we see one woman who needs to be healed because life is ebbing from her it is draining out of her and we see a young girl who is sick and then dies pretty much suddenly on the same day because in 12 years so the question was asked of the blind man as jesus was about to heal him who sinned this man or his parents and jesus said oh but this illness is not unto death but oh for the glory of god so i can say that god in his majesty and in his infinite wisdom and for those who will have faith he knows who but in whom he has deposited the gift of faith those who have faith they he may depart, he may cause them to have to go through something to make that faith get come to life and be birthed in them and to be raised up in them. So 12 years ago from the day that Jesus was walking from the synagogue through the city of Capernaum, the city of comfort to J. Iris's house, two things were allowed to happen to two different people. One child was born and it was already written in her book. It was already written in her destiny. It was already written in her blueprint that when she was about 12 years old, she was going to have this illness. And even in chapter 8, verse 49 of Luke, she was going to die from it. And that was written. But the woman with the issue of blood, no matter how old she was, whether she was 25 or 45 or 65, it was written in her book too. So who sinned? No. This was all to the glory of God and God orchestrated it. He orchestrated this thing to show us that Jesus is almighty, that he is omnipotent and he is all power. Just because he heals one doesn't mean he can't heal another. Even if the other grows worse, even if he gets distracted or waylaid or stopped. So you say he may not come when you want him because he may be helping somebody whose faith is stronger than yours or he may be helping somebody who is worse off than you are. He may not come Come when you want him but he's gonna get there right on time and he's gonna come forth with all power and with all omnipotence he is gonna come forth with all strength oh show forth praise to the Lord today in the name of Jesus hallelujah 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 glory to God so this thing was orchestrated 12 years prior the number of government but we have read in the book of Isaiah if you recall the scripture and you may have wondered at the time how they go together well the Lord puts what he will together for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Twelve is the number of government. Jesus was getting to the place. You know, Jesus, from the time he got here as a baby, and you too, as you walk through life, you go through stages of identity, stages of identifying yourself or being identified. So this number 12 for Jesus was doing some work that had to do with 
the government that was on his shoulder, the government to which there would be no end, the government which he would establish in the thrones of David, the government. But you see, the Lord will reign on the just and the unjust alike. So the young girl was going to receive of his peace because he was the prince of peace and what is peace peace for you is healing if you're sick peace for you is deliverance if you're being tormented peace for you is finances if you if you're walking in poverty peace for you is joy if you're over stricken with grief peace jesus said give them your peace when you go to a place offer them peace and that is what jesus offered throughout his whole entire walk here on the earth he offered peace in the form that would bring peace to those who needed peace, those who sought after peace, and those whose faith drew the peace from him. And he offered peace. So of his government and his peace, there shall be no end, the prophet Isaiah tells us in 9, 6, and 7. There shall be no end. So this is the number of government. And here was Jesus and his governmental authority doing something natural that the people could see once again. Oh, he's so kind and loving to us that he would take time to teach us, not just to heal our bodies, but to teach us and show us who he is and what he can do and what he will do for us and how he keeps covenant and keeps his word because his government shall continually increase. So here was Jesus walking the earth, came here on earth clothed in flesh as a man just like you and me. Only with the spirit of God and full of grace and truth, waxing bold in him. And here is Jesus come to do this thing. And he came to redeem mankind back to God, back to God. But what happened was as Jesus himself was walking the earth, as he was walking in the press. Stay with me now. As he was walking in the crowd, as he was walking in the throng and the multitude of people. Someone came up and touched him and drew virtue out of him. And as Jesus came to draw and to redeem mankind back to God, back to the Father, the law, the law of man, that same law that the Pharisees knew and interpreted well, that the Sadducees knew, that same law, that same law where the scripture says the letter of the law killeth. And that same law, that woman, the older woman with the issue of blood represents the law. The law came up and touched Jesus. Oh, Jesus. The law came up and touched Jesus. The law came and tried to pull power out of him. I'm not saying that woman was evil. I'm giving you, telling you with the symbolism of this story. The law came up and touched him and tried to draw power out of him. The law came up and touched Jesus. But I can tell you, no matter what's wrong with you, if you have the faith and you come up and touch Jesus, you know what's going to happen. You're not going to hurt him. He's going to heal you. And just like the he was turned over by Jesus to a uh, Judas, excuse me, Jesus was turned over by Judas to the Sadducees, to the Sanhedrin council and to Pilate and then back to the Romans who crucified him in the way they were trying to hurt Jesus. They were not able to hurt him, but Jesus was able to heal them when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So. The law came up and touched Jesus, but the law did not. The law did not hurt Jesus. Jesus stayed the loss of blood from the law. That is the letter of the law killeth. And that was the predominant thing before Jesus got there. It was the law. You had to keep this commandment and keep that one and keep that. And nobody without the spirit of God could keep them all anyway. You know that if you've been saved for more than 15 minutes yourself. Thank God for his spirit. So the law was was pressing him in. The law was encircling him. The law, just like the law was killing everybody else, the law was killing people and they were losing their blood because the letter of the law killeth. And so the law touched Jesus and the law drew virtue out of him. And you would think that would have weakened him, but he is all powerful. Hallelujah. He is almighty. He is an awesome God, mighty God, the everlasting father and the prince of peace. So he did not weaken him. Instead, he was strong enough to help the law, to stay the law. And then he went on to heal Jairus' daughter. Now, Stay with me now. Stay with me. He went on to heal Jairus' 12-year-old daughter. And all the while, Jesus was not distracted from what he was set out to do. That is to redeem mankind. That is to offer grace. 
to mankind because Jesus came to bring grace, but the law was still killing folk, so he had to set that straight first. So he had to heal the old lady before he could go to the new lady, the church, the young lady, to offer grace and eternal life. Hallelujah. So Jesus had no lack of power or strength to accomplish the goal that he needed, that he set out to accomplish, even though other things came up to beset him. And so that is your challenge today. Whatever the Lord has sent you to do, he's given you ample ability to do it. He's given you ample power to do it. He's given you ample strength and even wisdom. And if you don't have it within yourself yet, he's given you the ability to draw from the spirit, to draw what you need to do what you have been called to do, what you know to do, what you have been purposed to do right here on this earth. And no matter if you have been distracted, if he gives wisdom to those who ask, how much more power is made available to those who pray the effectual prayer of a righteous man? Hallelujah. So you need to continue and press on and do what you came here to do. So Jesus went to this only daughter of Jairus to resurrect her. Well, isn't that what was happening at the church? The church was dead because of the law. Listen to me now. Glory to God. The church was dead. The church, that's a woman. Someone's daughter. Oh, thank you, Lord. The church was dead because of the law. The letter of the law had killed it. You had the Pharisees interpreting it. You had the Sadducees, and they were all in their political parties. Well, you know, it's supposed to be religious, but it turned out to be more political parties killing it. And so... You might look at the church that you're in right now and say, oh, it's just too many rules. I can't do this. And I don't mean godly rules. I mean ungodly stuff. Then they added legalism in there where it was impossible to do what needed to be done. And so Jesus was on his way to redeem mankind back to, to the father. Jesus was on his way to bring us grace. But first he had to put his hands on the law because the law put his hands on them, on him. Jesus had to put his hands on the law to stop the blood leaking he had to stop the blood from draining out he had to stop the life from draining out because of the law he didn't do away with the law Jesus never killed the law the law is still in effect because the law is foundational to grace were it not for the law there would be no grace were it not for the older woman even though she had suffered for 12 years she didn't give up she waited and she received a touch from the master that she could be made right while he was on his way to give the young girl grace representing the church. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So even while he was on his way to do what he had to do, it didn't stop him. He had enough for what? The just and the unjust alike. We assume she may have been. He had enough for those who were of the house of Israel and for the others as the woman who asked for the crumbs of the, from the table will testify to. Jesus was on his way to instate a new government in the earth when the old system, the old way, tried to draw power from him. And this is no doubt to you because you know the story that Jesus got sent to that cross because the letter of the law killeth. And they kept looking for things in the law in order to legally put Jesus to death. They kept looking for things. The Pharisees kept looking for reasons to kill Jesus. They kept looking. And where did they look? They looked in the law. But we look at the works of the, of the flesh in Galatians 5 and 19 and on down to 22. And, but we look in Galatians 5 and 23, we see what the works, the fruit of the spirit are. And right at the end of that verse, you may read, and it says, against these things, against which is what it says, there is no law. See, there is no law against grace because grace is Higher than the law. Grace is more than the law. Grace is for those who have passed the test of the law. And they have a willingness. Grace is the spirit of the law. They have a willingness to obey the law. With all that is in them. And even with the Holy Spirit working in them. They have a desire and a willingness to obey the law. And because of that, they've moved in grace. So I look at the old man, J. Iris, who was a ruler in the synagogue. Who was... A man who had the authority and the position and the name and the title. But he also, because he was a ruler in the synagogue, this man Jairus had the willingness to obey the laws of God. The Mosaic laws, the laws that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. And remember those laws, we remember them as Ten Commandments, but there are many more laws, social laws, which you can read in the book of Leviticus, that Moses spent many more days getting from God so you can know how to treat folk. 
that are related to you, that are in the body of Christ, folk that are not related to you, folk that are married to you, folk that you're not married to, your children. The old man, because he was willing, then his only daughter received the grace. Because the old man abided by the law. Then the new one, his daughter, J. Iris, was willing to obey the law. Then his daughter was able to receive grace. See the levels here? Do you see this? Thank you, Lord. So, doesn't it say in the Old Testament that the, the elder will serve the younger? See, grace is only available because the law is there. But grace is still higher than the law. So even though Jairus was a ruler in the synagogue and served the law, grace, which was put on his daughter, which was the reason she was resurrected. It was the power by which she was resurrected. It's by the grace of God, by in, why, where, you know, where any of us will receive eternal life. Because of that, that is how it is served, and it's because it is in place. The old way is the law. That's the older daughter. She needed healing too. She needed healing because the letter of the law was killing the people. And the new way was grace. But there's the word that says, see that you do these things, but don't leave the other undone. Didn't Jesus say that? That means see that you obey the laws of God. Don't leave the laws undone, but still you should move in grace. And J. Iris' daughter, a female, the church, Jesus came. To resurrect all of us. To breathe a spirit back into all of us again. Hallelujah. To give us life so we can live and, and live and have abundant life here on earth. And then live eternally in glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See that you minister grace to the hearer. See that you minister grace to one another. But do not leave the law undone. Because he who is in grace does more than is required of him. If your mother left you at home and said, cook the chicken for dinner, legally you would cook the chicken for dinner. But if you were a child who moved in grace, you would cook the chicken and the potatoes and the string beans and have the table set. You would be moving in grace, which meant you would not have anyone, have any need to have anybody to watch over you. If your mother said, or your father said, and you're a man, cut the grass, you would not only cut the grass, you would oil the lawnmower thing up when you get through, clean it up, put it away, edge the yard, and you might even trim the hedges. That's grace. That's the same grace that we want. We want over and above what we ask for. We want over and above what we expect. I ask you, saints of God, are you giving over and above to anyone? Even to the Lord, even as unto the Lord, he says, what you've done for the least, you've done it unto me. Are you giving over and above, above to anybody on your job? I mean, without grumbling and complaining. Are you offering grace? You want grace? Offer grace. And grace will heal you. Grace will heal your children. Grace will heal your generations. It will heal your daughter. You want your daughter healed. Then, see that you do the law. Minister grace, but don't leave the law undone. The word says, do not let grace be an opportunity for you to sin. And J. Iris' only daughter received grace because he was willing to comply with the law. J. Iris' only daughter. But the woman with the issue of blood that had been draining out for 12 years... The number of government, remember, 12 years. And the law had been killing people for generations. The law had been draining the life out of them. The law had been overtaxing them. The law had been bleeding the life out of them. People trying to keep the law in order to get to heaven. You can't get there by the law. Only by Jesus Christ. Only by Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for your word of truth. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this woman with the issue of blood and Jairus' daughter who were born at some time close together 12 years before he walked the street in Capernaum to bless 
and be a blessing and to show the glory of God and to be examples even 2,000 years later to show us, to show us here who are called by your name what it is you're trying to teach us and to teach us from glory to glory and precept upon precept and line upon line what it is that you have for us. Lord, we thank you that you make all power available to us and that the effectual prayer, fervent prayer, the righteous makes power available to us and that we can have wisdom by asking and that we have a calling and destiny and purpose and that even though we may have been distracted, even though distractions may come, sometimes good, sometimes bad, Lord, temper us that we'll know when to turn to the side and minister to the left or to the right and when to press on forward. And Lord, even if something looks like it's dead, Let us know if it's only sleeping, if it's only dormant for a season, and that the touch of God, the breath of God, the words of life as we prophesy even to dead bones will bring back life to our situations and will heal our daughters, heal our children, heal our generations, and heal our churches. We thank you, Lord, and we glorify you. We glorify you, Lord. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.